All right, all right. Hello, everyone. I hope you can see and hear me, and I will start by sharing the screen. Okay. So, oh, the hash in the intranet. That's the first uh, episode of a two uh, of two episodes of the series uh, in which I would like to approach OAuth hash with a very pragmatic, uh, like let's say, task first approach, and uh, maybe less with the formal definition that you can easily find online. So, the episode today is about OAuth hash in the intranet. Why is this a picture with a paradise? Because in the intranet, compared to what will follow in the next episode in May. Uh, in the intranet, meaning like inside the company, the users, the uh, humans involved, uh, we know where they live. You know who they are. We can sue them. They are our employees. So as such, um, some of the concerns that OAuth hash, some of the attacks that OAuth hash can defend you against, uh, don't might don't are not really helpful. Like if I can say that. But to say it, to say at least, um, the focus of using the oh, hash inside the uh, inside the internet, inside the uh, inside the I mean, I mean, facing your own users, your own employees, is a bit let's say different. And here are some problematics I would like to to tackle today with you. Let's see how how far we can go with the um, with the demos. But uh, I would I would still want to sneak these ideas in. Uh, so. There are, these are some, some features that uh, you might want uh, if when you, whenever you implement about the hash inside your internet. Now, very important, if you have any questions, please uh, use any channels you can. I will keep an eye on the Q&A and uh, at the end, I will do my best to answer as many of, as I can. So here are some, some, some use cases of about the hash. Probably the most widespread use I see today is for implementing single sign-on. In short, asking the, your employees, your users to only log in once. And then to, um, to automatically log them in into different systems that you might have inside your, uh, your intranet exposed to them, right? Then uh, to restrict what the user can do. Technically speaking, to uh, be able to link a user with a, with a role or maybe uh, some fine grained permissions you will see uh, today. today. The next question is those uh, fun those uh, those uh, function level authorizations. If the user can uh, delete a contract, create a customer, can they do that in any system? Can they create contracts in all the three systems that manage contracts, or do we want to go like system specific authorization? Meaning that okay, you can create contracts in that system, but you cannot create contracts in my system, for example. Like you can you can grant. Uh, authorities per system, not, not globally per the entire ecosystem. Right? This is more for uh, co companies that have many, 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 many internal systems like bank, banks, telecom, stuff like that. Then uh, the uh, first vulnerability in the IP API security, you will hear more about these vulnerabilities tomorrow. I'll tell you in a moment. But um, okay, an employee can create a contract. Fair enough. But can that employee create any kind of contract? Can it edit? Can, can they edit any kind of contract? Like, like, I mean, like, um, in, in general, I could create contracts, but how about that contract? Can I edit that one, right? It's basically when the user is granted access on a subset of the data. And then how do we basically not impersonate the user, but at least propagate the, 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 the authorization of the user, act on behalf of the user uh, when calling other microservices, for example, like perform some actions in the name of the, of the king of the user and then uh, how do we log out from a single sign-on system which are pretty much connected all right but uh, you know what i'll tell you what before we, we proceed more i want to uh, spend a minute to introduce myself my name is victor Enta. i am one of the three romanian java champions today um, um, i am doing uh, consultancy and um, training throughout uh, the europe Many, many, I mean, eight years ago, I realized coding is not enough. So I started doing, uh, helping others. And now I'm doing trainings and consultancy throughout Europe. My main topics are these, clean code architecture, unit testing, Spring Hibernate Reactive to get to, to be able to talk about the topics that I love most. You need to handle a bit of the frameworks first. You need to master them a bit. And then secure coding and performance, out of which this topic today directly comes out of. Good. If you want to know more, this is my, um, this is where you can find the full detailed offer with all the conditions and all the detailed agenda and so on. 
Right. You can also find many of my talks online on YouTube, recorded from past conferences. And I also have a beautiful community of my own, which is a, which is Booker Software Craftsmanship Community, which is a very pre good place to be. If you are not there, you are you don't know what you're missing. Five thousand, almost five hundred per participants, and tomorrow evening, like like continuing the discussion from from today, will I will talk about uh, the top most um, common vulnerabilities when implementing REST APIs. So be there, completely free, completely remote, completely in English. So that what what happens for the past several years, and you can find many of my uh past recorded community events on my youtube channel right i also have two children and a cat that annoys me during the night so that's me now resuming the discussion here before we dive in into the into seeing how we all the hash can help us with that we need to set a bit of terminology a bit of uh, a glossary of terms if i may so here we are this is like the main the fundamental concepts of all out the hash um, before we even get there, I want to maybe even step, uh, take a step back and um, have a little debate here. Uh, when people mention auto hash, it can mean two things, can't it? It can mean auto authorization or authentication. There are two different things that can um, be underneath the auto hash. The, this world. So when they when they said auto auto hash, they was they were really mean to us because they didn't tell us what they mean of. Authentication means to tell who the user is, like identifying the, like telling who he is. And then authorization is answering the, the question whether the user can do something or not. Let me find a slide from my deck here. There was a place in which I explained exactly for a couple of seconds. So authentication means to, to identify who the user is. Authorization means to identify what the user can do. Um, if the user is allowed to do a certain action, right? So when they named it out hash or out hash, they didn't weren't very, very clear, right? But authorization or the hash is actually talking about authorizing, about granting permission to do something to the owner of a token. You will see that in a moment. So let's put the terms properly. First of all, well, probably the most confusing concept, the most let's say it took me the most to, to grasp is that the client in the in the auto hash terminology means not a you, not a human. Now, not a company, not, uh, no, 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 it's just an application. So whenever you will hear client today and next episode, you will always think of, of application. So the client is an application that wants to act on behalf of this human against this other microservice or against this other system. Or there. I don't care what that is, right? So uh, this API that you have to, that you want to call, that, that the client wants to call, it can only be called by presenting that system with a magic token. You will see that in a moment. I will already point it. It is called an access token. So the client application that wants to call another system in behalf of this human will have to present a token to that system. Right? All right. Now, resource owner means human. It's the only person in this whole picture. Right? It's a human that is actually logging in. It's John Doe, that guy. Okay. And the authorization server is this magic, is this super powerful, it's full of security constraints uh, server. In our game, it will be Keyclock that will act as a, uh, let's say, the engine of OAuthHash. You will see it happening. You will see in a moment a lot of stuff happening uh, around that, that system. Good. Now to define the, the concepts on this list. Next. Single sign-on, what the heck is that? Well, passwords. When you think of passwords, turn back time 10 years ago, and you had to enter passwords for every system everywhere, right? Humans hate passwords. Humans are bad with passwords. They really, 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 really reject creating new passwords. So if you ask your employees to set user passwords for all of your systems, they will end up repeating the same passwords everywhere. This is what 10 years ago was happening. Right? So if one of the systems somehow uh, loses the password user combination, all of, the, all of the systems become vulnerable. So you, it's a bad practice to ask users to create new passwords. So instead, you would require them to do a single time login at a central login application. And after they do that, they will uh, automatically be able to log in into any application in your intranet, in, 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 the, in your ecosystem, right? And then all the apps on the internet would, would use that identity provider, in, in our case, the key clock, to, um, to log in a user. 
And that calls for a demonstration. I don't want to, to freak you out with, with this picture, but I will want to sneak this in your brain by the end of today, by the end of this hour. So let's, let's jump in and see how stuff works. I have a Git that if you want to copy to, to, to um, uh, how can I do that? How can I, how can I show you the actual Git location? Uh, this is spring.git. This is a Git location. And uh, if you want to re reproduce what I'm doing, go there and uh, play with that afterwards. Now, I, sh I should probably create a branch for you, right? So let's say like Pentalog 2023.03. There you go. Now we have a branch. Congratulations. Now, um, in this game that we have over here, I will start an application called Spring application, right? It runs on 8080. Uh, to make things super, super clear and uh, be sure that I do not uh, keep any cookies yet, I will, clear, I will kill the browser, open it again. And um, 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 when, I, when I open a tab pointing to localhost 8080, which is where my application is running, my application, because I, did not I don't have any, any session, any active session with that application, the application doesn't know me. Right? Ten years ago, the application would have presented me a login screen with user password. Today, it doesn't. If I go to 8080, if I enter, I will get redirected to 8180, where there is a Kicklock instance running in a Docker. So please, guys, welcome the Docker. Say so say hi to the Docker. This is a Kicklock over here running. Okay, and uh, and that instance over there is just I got redirected to 8180, and then I, I am supposed to log in. Let's say log in as an admin, right? To to this. When I when I will click sign in, I will be redirected back to 8080. Right? So let's see. Sign in, 8080. And the application is saying me, hi, it's telling me, hi, admin, how are you? All right. So, um, um, well, uh, two factor. I will get that, that after the, uh, so the question at the end. Um, what the heck? Let's answer that. So, who initiated the one with the hash here? Well, the try me trying to get to 8080. I got redirected to 8180, who presented me the, with the login screen, right? Now, if you play two-factor authentication, if you, pack, if you play two-factor authentication, that means that when I, when I had to log in in 8180, I would get a message on my phone telling me, are you really Victor? Yes, thank you, All right? That's called two-factor authentication, like with the bank, for example. I did not get any message on my, on my phone, that would have meant, but that's the, just the responsibility of the central authorization server. In, in, my, in, in my game, in my picture over there, it would just be, just let's find the slide, one slide, where are you? Here. In, in the picture that I, that I sketched, that two-factor authentication is a, is a thing that can happen here. When the, lo the center login authenticates the user, tries to figure out that you are really Victor, right? Only then. So I think that uh, we, 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 we do for an answer. All right. So next, keep, keep shooting questions. If I go to 8080, I got the and then I, I got back to the application. Now let's see what happens if I access another application in my ecosystem. Localhost 8088. Okay, that's a very weird port. But let me open the fire, uh, sorry, the the, um, the uh, network traffic inspector. Now I did not. I don't have any any location. Yes, that is the yes. That's the link, John. I don't have any location, any 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 session active with 8088. So when I go when I access that application. However, I am immediately logged in as an admin. How the heck was that possible? Right? Now, the mystery is, lies in here. If I access localhost at port 8088, okay, that's a very bad port number, but I should remember, 8088, I can't even pronounce this. And that, that got the redirect, uh, sending me to 8088 spa, then 8088 SSO login. I'm still in my world. And then I got a big redirect to 8180. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kiklo. And then my my brother got the, uh, got redirected to Kiklo, to which it went with this following request. Now, I didn't see any login screen, did I? What happened? The Kiklo behind the, 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 the host 8180 Autohash Realms Learning Realm Protocol of this badness this domain logged me in immediately without, re without requesting me any kind of user password. How is this possible? How would I know that? Because the next thing you see is a 302 redirect back to the application without showing any screen, just immediately under the hood. How the heck was that, ha was that possible? Now, the magic lies in, the, in a hidden cookie 
the so-called SSO cookie. You will see it in the in the graph as a pink cookie. Remember, the, there will there will be this this pink cookie around that will sort of, that that is opened between the browser and eighty one eighty, which is Kiklo. That cookie, magic cookie, the, the SSO cookie, the single sign-on cookie, makes sure that whenever I try to access any application, whenever the center login sees me, it redirects me back to the application to, from which, where I came immediately logging in, logging me in. Why? Because it keeps a cookie that expires tomorrow. Okay, that's actually re re really, really tomorrow. <laughs> it expires like eight hours from now. So this magic cookie over there with the um, this session thing, if, if I blow this up, however, if I destroy these cookies, right? If I destroy these cookies, and I try again this, this, this magic to, uh, um, let me just, Let's start over from, from scratch because I will be otherwise distracted by another trick that I don't want to fall into. So let's log into the first application, right? Nice and easy. Now, if I go to, the, to, that, to that URL I showed you just now, which is this, and I look at the cookies that I have open with this domain, uh, if I kill all the cookies and I try to access 80, 80, 80, 88, bad port number, if I try to access the other application, I will get redirected to login and login will say, who the heck are you, right? And it will present me with a login screen. And again, you are, right? Because I just blew up that hidden cookie that, I, that kept my session with a single sign-on server. So I have to log in again, you see? So I think, I think you have uh, had the first glimpse of what SSO means. So let's, let's try the, let's try with this. First, uh, it's, it's a very big danger of you panicking. Do not look at all the picture. Look, at, look only where I, where, I, where, I, where I put the focus on, right? So once upon a time, there was a browser that we call Bro. Yo, Bro. This Bro tried to access the application with no session. I went to 8088. Bad port number, 8088. Who the heck? And that guy, the, the application said, who the heck are you? And it redirected me. Uh, to be honest, that's the first redirect that happened uh, when I got, let's start over again to reproduce once more yet the, the whole flow. I will enter again to 8080. When I go to 8080, bang, redirect to, to center login, I will log in with this. And then to, 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 to put the full picture of what you'll see in the, in the, in the diagram, I will, if I go now to localhost 8088, I don't need to log in again. I'm already admin, right? So in the slides, what, what the heck happened? Focus, uh, um, follow this, 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 I have a problem, a technical issue with my little, just a second. Uh, it really died. My tool that I drew on the screen just died. Screen brush. Where are you? Yoo -hoo. Thank you. Good. So, access the application with no session. Get redirected to the app authorization server, to Keyclock. This redirect goes through the browser to the Keyclock server, who says, who the heck are you again? Give me the user password, please. The user, the human, needs to provide the user password combination to the Keyclock server. Keyclock server, once it sees this tree, comes for four. With four, it redirects me back to the application. Basically, it redirects the browser back to the application. But while doing that, it puts on that redirect URL a special code. A special code. Let me actually show the code, although it's maybe too early for that, but still. If I access AT, okay, if I just admin, admin, login, you will see the redirect back to 8080 carrying along a special token called code. This, my friends, is the first cryptographic material, actually the first thing you, the first important bit in all the hash right now. This code goes from 8180 to 8080. Let me show you the actual endpoint that did the magic here. When I did the post to 8180, in, in, in reply, I got a redirect to 8080. So this is where uh, our kick lock redirects me back to the application, to my application, carrying along this code that we see. This code is super important. Why? <clears throat> because what happens next, it's a bit mind blowing. This code that, hap that, that goes along, right? Gets back to my application in the URL, in a redirect. What happens next? My application, 8080, takes this beautiful code from here and exchanges it in an invisible way. It's called back channel. It changes this, let's put it in blue, to be honest. Blue, I said. Thank you. It changes this blue thing with a key clock with, an, with, a, with a direct call between the two servers. And in, in, in reply to that blue thing, it gets something extremely important. 
the Axis Open, which is like the shit. This is like the, this is what you're all, what you're after. This Axis Token gets here, and this Axis Token, the purple, the, the orange thing here, it really represents that the user is who he claims he is. But you don't see that yet, and we will cover this in more detail in the next episode. This is just the back channel under the hood. Let's not let's not kill our brain with that for now. The only thing that matters now is that this code for our discussion came through the browser and was exchanged like under the radar with, with an invisible request with the keycloak to get the actual access, let's put it in orange, access token, right? Yes. Now, up until here, we were able to log into 8080, right? Once the application gets the access token from the key clock with the through the back channel, then it means that the application can indeed, if the access token is valid, then it means that the application can create a session. And at this moment over here, it will create the user session for the for whoever is in front of this browser. Creating a session means setting a cookie in my browser that tells that this application is indeed connected, is indeed logged, successfully logged in to 8080. So at the end of this whole flow, I will get my cookie, which represents the interaction, which, rep which keeps the session between the browser and the application. Let's see that cookie, the, the green cookie. In my 8080, if I go to application cookies, I have this, you might be familiar with JSession ID if you're using Java, right? This is the session ID that got created between the browser and my 8080 application, right? That's the green cookie, okay? But that's not the only cookie. There is also the pink cookie. What the heck is that? Let's rewind a bit time, the, the time. When, opa, when you were redirected back to Keycloak and Keycloak logged you in, when it redirected you back to the application carrying the code, the code was not the only thing that it sent you. No, 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 no. It also pushed you this pink cookie. This pink cookie survives in the browser. Now, according to the HTTP uh, standard, what, whenever the browser will ever access 8180 again, whenever the browser will go to Keycloak again ever in the future, he, they, the browser is forced to play the cookie along with any request to the same host, to the same domain. So what happens next? Let me dissect the request, what happens next. If I go to localhost 8088, the other application over here, this, let's see what happens in the network. In the network, I got redirected at some point to 8180. You see, this was a get for, from 8180 that resulted in a 302 redirect, right? Uh, back to my application. But how was this able to log me in without requesting the user password? The key lies in the request headers. The request header that went to, to Keycloak carried along within this madness of cookies. One of, one of the, here, Keycloak session, this is it. Keycloak session, this really, uh, um, um, this allowed the server to identify the browser. And basically, figure, the authorization server figures out that this browser has logged in previously with this same 8180. Because that, look, when 8088 tries to, when, I, when the same browser tries to access this, this results in a, in a redirect back uh, to the uh, to the keycloak server, but along with the redirect comes the pink cookie, which is typically sort of, which typically survives eight or twenty four hours. That cookie goes to keycloak. Keycloak by the cookie identifies the browser and logs you in immediately, providing the same code you needed, but without asking for user password. That, my friend, is called single sign on. You sign in once. We're providing user passwords once to this host. And every time you go again to the same host, you will be automatically logged in, All right? Okay, so that crosses the first one from the list, I hope. If there are any questions, please shoot, All right? Let's see the next one. Function level authorization. What does that mean? Let's first the slide. Function level authorization aims to control, basically you see, again on the same slide, and focusing on that dark part that we did not see yet. You see, when the application gets the code, the blue thing, it goes on the back channel and exchange this code with the access token. Access token. The holy access token. That access token is, is a Java, uh, it's a JSON web token. That JSON web token I intercepted and I printed in the console for you over here. 
So you see, the token that I got from the back channel is printed right in front of you over here. It's a, basically a JSON with a, with a twist. It's, it's a JSON which is signed, which is signed so that no one intercepting the communication that happens on the back channel could forge such a token. So basically, the, the, the key clock creates a JSON, right? Then signs with its, sign, with its signature and sends this to the application. The application validates the signature, unpacks the JSON, and then reads stuff from it. Good. Now, what happened? What, what do I mean by doing where, where was I? the function level authorization? This means that you want to control what the user can do. How will this work? You will put inside your token from the key clock, you will have the key clock telling the applications what roles has the user. Roles. Roles, okay? Role based authorization. Now, if you've lived <laughs> long enough, you've met applications that uh, for which role level authorization is impractical, for which you want to have not control at the role level. Why? Because there are 10 roles. It's insanely complex to maintain such an application. So instead, you would want to control individual permissions, actions that you can do. Notice the difference between role level and permission based authorization. Am I allowed to delete the training? If I am, I would, I would be able to call the endpoint and see the button in the user interface, right? So it, it, it makes the application maintenance uh, better, uh, easier and less risky. So this button will disappear if I don't have training delete permissions and the backend endpoint will get blocked automatically if I don't have the delete training permission. So, we are talking about two ways of doing function level authorization, role level or fine grained permissions. Now, if you choose role level, you can have key clock putting in the token, the admin role. But you can also have key clock putting in the token, let's say permissions. How does this work? Let me bore you a bit with the administrative console of key clock. Let me log in here as, as God, I mean like the super user that can access key clock. And you will see here in the role that the admin user can be a composite role. Whenever I say that this guy is an admin, then it can delete a training, right? So what does this mean? When a user is assigned the training role, my goal is not to teach you the key clock admin console, but still, if the admin in the role map, in, in, in the, here, yes. If I assign this admin user to have this role, it automatically got training.delete. That's called composite roles in key clock. What will be the effect? If I close it up everything, and I enter again the application. Uh, Chrome, I'm looking for Chrome, but I just closed it. Chrome, please. Okay. So if I log in again as admin to the application, come on, admin, admin, then in the, in the, in the token that I got under the, through the back channel, I would see now, if I scroll, look, in the previous, I will see here, turning delete, you see? Turning delete and admin. So that means that inside the token, you can find out what permissions your users can have, right? can act upon, can, can use basically, right? So um, then any access token you have, uh, which is signed and valid, this access token can basically delete trainings, okay? But that kind of, of permission of, you see, there's a single, there's a problem with this. Look at the, um, at the, at the how the token looks like. Now, this token, this single token can be taken and thrown against another API. We get to that. It's what happens if your application over here decides to use the access token that it got to call another microservice, another API. Right? So once you get an access token in the name of the user, you can play it against other APIs. But that's a bit strange. I mean, you got an access token. It says role admin. Yeah, but role admin for who? If I would be the only consumer of the token, if the token was intended just for me, then it works perfect. It, it would have been perfect. But the same token I could, I could ship over a, over a request header to another API. In which case, the token saying admin inside would, would actually mean that the user, that user at, the, at this end, is admin also in that microservice or in that application. Is that right? So you see the difference? There is, uh, 
I made I made all the difference between global roles and application scoped roles. This is what I want to go next. So the ones that you, you saw just now here, these are real, which means ecosystem, ecosystem wide, ecosystem wide access. Is that mean? I bet many times that would not be enough. So that's why we need system scope authorization. What the heck is that? It's uh, it's when a user can have different permissions in different systems. I mean, like the one I don't know, um, the regular employee can be admin of a, of an application running inside the back or in like inside the I don't know the shop something in the office in some site, but might not even have user admin user role in a back end super core system over there that manages contracts and invoices. It might not be that employee's role to, to manage that, to, to access that. So the access token can then contain different roles per resource. That's called resource access. What does that mean? It means that you have, you see, Spring App, Mic Spring Micro. These are two clients in wow, the hash terms. I told you, remember, apps, uh, um, clients are basically applications. So in this application, I, am, I have this permission. In this application, I have this permission, right? And the client is a holder, receiver of that. Now, um, uh, Magomed, you asked about client credential flow, which was broken, unless you're using Pixie. I will not. Look, look, look. So Magomed talks about a, bad, uh, a commonly widespread practice, which is not very secure. Let me show you the, what, what he means there. Um, in, there is this alternative flow called implicit flow in which the access token over there, if you follow this very carefully, you will see that the access token is never, is never reaches the browser. Never reaches the browser, you see? But there is this other flow in which the access token is actually shipped and stored in the freaking browser. Ah! That's freaking risky. Freaking risky. Because, I don't know, libraries, XSS, cross-site script injection, uh, there, the, the moment you put your token in the JavaScript world, you run much more. So the general advice is to have this backend system that hides the token, it keeps the token from from go, from leaking into the browser, even up, even, even as far as talking about a concept called backend for frontend, a super thin application just aiming to keep the access token away from the browser. That's like in the all oh, the hash best practices. It's it's it's, it's, it's over there. Right. So no, I will not talk about that practice of taking the access token and put it in inside the single page application. No, no. So in the access token, the access token means you are allowed to do stuff and to also ask uh, Mike, that access token allows you to do stuff. So to do stuff might mean to behave as an admin in Spring Micro and to have this permission in Spring App. So this token contains everything you could ever do, right? Now you could think, you could you could ask yourself how big can this token grow, <laughs> right? So that's a that's a that's a that's a, especially if you have these like 100 these, because you have many buttons in your application, right? So the size of the token might at some point be interesting, but what I'm talking here about is having application specific authorization why is it called resource access you might ask what's what's the point remember a resource server it's the server that you want to act upon using the token it's the server that your token unlocks features unlocks functionalities in right so so um i will get to that magomed that's another story um the ones whoever keeps the access token can call APIs and APIs will just open and if you can do features, you can access features with that token, right? So the token once issued by this authorization server can open any door that the user can open, right? This is like the default in the internet. So if you, I can access three applications, you will have resource access for three applications. And I can easily see, I've seen situations in which um, receiving a system might reject an access token just because it has no roles for that X system. So if you are, I don't know, the X system, and you don't, if, you don't, if you don't find an entry here, you might just blow up and say, hey, you don't have access to my application. Yeah, I know that you are John. Congratulations, John. But what are you doing in my application, right? So function, like application scoped 
resource access in short. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, there is this discussion. I want to. I don't want to postpone it. Magomed asked, "What about opaque token?" Now, folks, uh, you probably many of you have have heard of this of this site. That uh, if you paste any 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 GVT token, any JSON web token over there, like look, this is actual encoded GVT token. If you paste this GVT token in here, right, this baby, it it can parse the token and it's plain base64 encoded data. So anyone keeping the token can read the, the information inside, including the email, right? So um, there are two problems with this access token. Uh, the one that Magomed is talking about is uh, whether someone can read the information from this token that I don't want someone to read, which is like secrecy. Would I want any holder of this token to know that the email is that, that the first name is that? Yes or no? If you don't want to this to be a plain sight visible, you would need to use Java Web GVE encrypted, JSON Web encrypted token. But the Java, the JSON web token is just plain, plain, job, plain JSON, base64 encoded and signed. Look, GVT, GVE, there's an article for you if you want to read more. GVE, there. And there is also GVF, just to make things even more complicated. How, how can I put this? Maybe screenshot of the, <laughs> this article in it. So indeed, in, uh, but not in the intranet. In the intranet, being concerned about someone reading the contents of this JSON. Now, this is interesting when you play in the wild, in the internet, right? You might not want to see Victor Renta moving around in plain text between systems, right? So no, I will not go in that direction today, maybe in May, in the next episode. Good. So nice, nice discussion, nice question. I love it. Keep, keep, uh, keep, keep shooting. Now, the next authorization that you need to think of is uh, maybe I could dive more into here, although it's not my, probably the perfect moment, but um, uh, still, how does this play with Java? Yeah, who uses Java? I don't know, I don't know, but still, if you will use Java, you can tell the framework to extract the, the roles from the real access, the one that we just saw in, the, in, the, in here. No, real access was the previous one, this. You can extract the roles from here, but that's an implementation thing in your code, right? You choose. Or if you uncomment this line, you will just read it from the, from the resource access under my client name. So if my name is, let's, let me show you that. If my name is uh, uh, app, actually not here, no, my bad, sorry. I'm not here, if my, my, my client name is called Spring App, then under Spring App, I will find uh, my roles and I will, read in I will read them from there, right? Here, spring up. So these will be my roles, basically. If I just uncomment that line, right? I don't have time to demo everything. You just have to trust me that, right? Good. And up above, down below here, there is another discussion about whether you unpackage roles or permissions. You remember? Roles, like admin or permission. Can I delete the training, please? Right? There are two. Okay. Right. Uh, one more question, I see. Um, Injected wallets could help to reduce a lot of administration. You need to be more more explicit, more 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 verbal, please. More details. What you mean? So the next kind of authorization that is uh, the number one security vulnerability in REST APIs today. I just saw such a vulnerability in one of my clients several weeks ago. A pen test team found one of such vulnerabilities. It was brilliant. I will let's say. Hey, not emulate, rip. <laughs> you, you will see something similar tomorrow. Object level is very dark. It can get very, very dark. But object level authorization really means that, for example, a user can only be authorized to access or change a subset of data. Imagine a, an employee of a telecom company working in a, in a, in a shop, right, in an office, uh, selling, uh, I don't know, uh, how do you call those? SIM cards. Right? or phones, right? And that employee um, might, might not be granted access, might be able to see some contracts, contracts for persons, for, for physical persons, but might not be granted to read contracts or for corporate, for corporate customers. They might be, there might be a flag. Is this employee allowed to read those heavy, super important contracts or only those for human persons, right? So 
So um, the access token can then carry along the, the necessary information for the systems to be able to reject a certain action on a certain object. To, to make, it, make it boring simple, um, this token that you see over here contains this um, admin for language. Now, normally, folks, again, I, I would normally go into all of this from all of these topics with all the demos and all the playing around about about a full day in my workshop of secure coding. But the point is, if you are an admin for Java, you will not be able to see nor delete nor edit nor create PHP trainings. So once you are admin for this, it's like you only see and can change that data. What happens next? If many if 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 but the information on which you you filter the data and you restrict the actions comes along in the token that's what i want to say here so it can be administered it can be uh, managed at the key clock level it comes in the token itself so that employee that we talked about in the shop might have in the token a flag uh, named can see corporate customer set to false right and then the applications are in charge to do the necessary ifs and validation to make sure they don't leak that kind of information out, right? So I thought KickLock would include only the permissions for the client that initiated. No, it includes the permissions for because that token. Here, here comes the, the 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 third. This one, that token can be propagated to another API, in which case that token that you keep in your in your hand that you received in the first app needs to unlock doors from other systems right now osama you might be uh, uh, in another environment in which you are using scopes to restrict uh, the the quantity of the quantity of authorization you get in the token that's another dark thing that has to do more with the internet than with the intranet but in the environments i saw in the intranet inside a single company you're getting the token all the permissions for all the applications you can access with that token Right. Which makes that token pretty damn scary, isn't it? I mean, like, it can open everything. Yeah. So that's why that access token has a very short expiry expiration. Look, let's look at the, at the log over here. Um, whenever I print the access token, I also print how much time it's left until it expires. So at, um, at some point in time, this token was expiring in five minutes. So that access token gets very easily destroyed. It has a very short life. What happens after the access token expires is magic. It's, it's, it's magic. What happens? You remember the code we saw, the blue thing that, that moved? Um, that came from the browser to the application, that code over there can be exchanged with the access token. The access token. The access, access, access token. But the access token expires in minutes. What needs to happen? Five minutes after you've been issued an access token, you need to go. The application goes automatically, uh, invisibly to the to Kicklock to, to to take out another access token. So what will it do? It will use the refresh token it got. So technically, when you exchange the code, you don't only get the authorization, the the access token. You also get the refresh token. That refresh token can be later replayed back to get a new pair of tokens. So when you when you when you when you when you use that refresh token. With the with Kicklock, you get back a new access token and a new refresh token. That's very magic stuff that happens. Why? Why all this? Because the access token can leave the system. Exactly the reasons why what why you what you mentioned. Because the access token can be sent to other systems, and the moment that cryptographic that 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 thing leaves your system, Godspeed. It gets way, way more dangerous to someone would, would intercept and use that. So an access token gives you five minutes by default of time to play, after which you need to have a refresh token to be, to be able to continue to play, right? But that's invisible. That's invisible. That's invisible. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see back. Um, I want to, to play the next, uh, the next um, uh, point. Uh, propagating user identity and authorization over calls to another system. 
let me introduce you briefly to how this is done like uh, if you are a, if you played a lot with if you are a developer it will be super brain that simple what i'm showing you here especially if java you won't have any problems look over here hocus pocus i get the token the 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 access token let me let me put the proper music access the holy token that opens the doors, right? That access token I get somehow from the key cloak infrastructure running in my application. And that access token I put in the authorization header under better space. So in the request I sent to another system, I put inside in the authorization header the same token that I am that I have in my application. Well, you know what I'm doing here? I am delegating, I, I I'm using the access token to call another API that I want to open, all right? So I'm targeting here the URL um, AT82, AT82 over there. And that URL is also connected to Keycloak and it's also running. What a surprise. It's called micro app. So let's see what happens. If I click edit over here, edit. When I clicked edit, that code that we saw over here just ran, took the access token from the Keycloak in my application, put it in the header of the request, send the request to the other system, got back the response. But you know what's fun? That the data returned from that other system says, hey, hello, admin, how are you? How could you know? I sent that system the same token I got, right? And that system checked, I mean, I could extract the username from it. So that's why that system knows I'm the admin. Basically, I'm propagating the user identity. I logged in once, to my single to my to my application this application and then this application whenever whenever uh, called can, can call an endpoint to another microservice propagating who i am hmm okay and it gets it gets better that other application over here uh um uh, looks in the you need you have to trust me that it's called spring micro but looks in the token for roles under its own application name. So if I don't have role micro admin, I will not be able to call that system because that system authorizes every request to have this role. You don't have the role, bye bye, you can't enter. So the token, you see, I got the token from the authorization server back in the, in the, in the diagram, in the big picture. Where are you? The big picture. The, I, I use this to, to freak people out. Hello, Autohas. Good morning. So, the token that I got from author from the Keycloak server using the code I initially got through the browser, that same token contains inside some magical information that will open the door when used against the microservice, the Spring Micro. That blue, that yellow thing over here is the resource access for the, for that microservice, right? And I will basically propagate the token uh, over the call to that system. That's called like propagating identity of the user, right? It's time for more questions. I see two or more, three more occurred. So <clears throat> an as an example, as an example, you could make a smart contract. Let me register. Ah, you are explaining the the, um, the wallet stuff. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm not familiar with the concept, but I will get myself up to up to up to date with that. I'm experimenting a bit with that in the back end. Congratulations. Is there any limit for the refresh token? Aha. I mean, like, when would the refresh token really expire? That's a good question. Days, weeks, years, right? Years, my damn, damn it, years. Imagine an application on the mobile. Although that's already not, not, no longer internet, is it? An application on the mobile could keep a refresh token for years, with which it can get from, I don't know, Google, from whatever, from, from an authorization server, from Keycloak, it could get back new access tokens whenever you need. That's why you don't need to log in again in some mobile applications because they keep that refresh token somewhere that they can exchange with access tokens whenever they please. Hmm? So a refresh token survives maybe maybe eight hours, maybe a day, maybe more, right? Um, the one we saw you today expired in about eight hours, if I remember, actually that was the cookie. The refresh token lives more than that, to be honest. But yeah, you can you can tweak that, of course. But uh, that's the general rule: days, days, and minutes for the access token. 
Good. So accidentally, we kind of already saw the propagating of user identity. I was calling another system with the same access token I got. Right. This is I'm showing you a prepared demo. So it's not like it would feel if you would do this hands on for a full day, but to get the picture right now, the next drama, the last drama is how the heck do you log out? Now this problem, this is a nasty problem. Classic, classically, this was a terrible, this was a quite a challenge. Imagine the scenario you have application one, application two, and you have here Kicklock, the authorization server. Remember the pink cookie? The pink cookie remains with the browser. Right? Now, what does it really mean to log out from a system? Now, traditionally, logging out meant you need to kill your cookie. So, uh, indeed, there are more cookies between every of these systems and the browser. One cookie there, one cookie there. But if you kill this session, this doesn't mean much. Let me demonstrate. And that could lead to, to, to problems when you debug stuff or when you play with applications and you might not understand why not. You might be, tempting to, you might be tempted to, to log out. And log out classically means to kill the cookies. I just kill the cookies for 8080. If I, if I press refresh, I expect to be logged in again. Hi, admin. What the heck happened? But I think you, you suspect what happened. Right? Let's put the, the scary picture. I just killed this cookie. But when the browser went to the application, it carried along, I mean, I never killed the pink cookie. It carried, it carried along the, the pink cookie when it went to, 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 to log in to Kicklock. And the pink cookie logged me in automatically. So it's not enough to kill your own cookie. You need to kill the Kicklock cookie. Fortunately, Kicklock does implement such a distributed login with two mechanisms, front channel and back channel. So this logout button over here is actually able to log me out from all the systems. Look, I have 8080, 8088, right? Both are admin, congratulations. If I log out here, refreshing this, will my session has expired. Right? How does this happen? I invite you to explore. But it's a bit, there has to be a communication between Kicklock and the other server, telling that guy, die, kill the, kill the session. Pretty magic and pretty advanced. Let's see more, more questions. The refresh token is not able to retrieve another access refresh token pair when logging out. Um, if you uh, log out from a single application, look, technically speaking, if you kill the green cookie over here, in, the, in that session that the green cookie talked, uh, kept alive, there is the access token and the refresh token. If you killed this session from your side, you technically killed your refresh token and your access token because there is nothing, there is nothing on the backend of my application uh, um, related to my user, right? But the magic happens with the with the with the pink cookie in between. If the pink cookie is still there, you would be automatically logged in again. With a, another code will be issued for you. The code will be exchanged from for 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 a new access access token and refresh token so you're you're back live without knowing and that might get you confused sometimes so the access token does contain identity information you might have heard you might have heard uh, Margaret by the open id connect which is another technology that comes to help or out the hash to carry more personal information of the user but the username email, maybe even more languages and stuff like that would come in the access token automatically. But if you plan of carrying a lot of personal information, probably the access token itself is not the proper place to put it, but you will have to carry it in an, in an open ID connect token. I also printed that token over here. If I'm, if I'm mistaken here, open ID connect. Kicklock automatically gives you so. I didn't want to make the, the picture even more complicated, but when it gives you here the tokens, here, it gives you not only access token, any fresh token, but also open ID connect token, which is yet a third, a third GVT token. So GVT IO and the open ID connect token, if you just 
you get JSON. You can get more information about it. In this case, I don't see much more, but you could see more information in the Connect, depending on how you configure stuff. Right? Christian, is it a good practice for the access token to contain permissions of the user or all applications? Isn't it wrong from a security perspective that application X sees what permission the user has for application Y? What does that mean? It means that, I mean, like, look, you get the token from here into here. And this application is able to look inside the token to see what this user can do in the other application. Okay. What is the scenario we're talking about? What if a hacker hacked this application? I mean, I will let, this, let aside the scenario of rogue employees trying to destroy the company from inside. No, I will not play the game. But instead, I will, I will ask this, is this application under attack? Was it corrupted? Now, if this application was hacked and the hacker got access to the actual bytecode, could do such a hash, could deploy code, that, that, that uh, hacker could see indeed the token coming in, could inspect what roles the user, that token have for other systems. It might want to play the token to other systems. That can happen. But that's why we, this discussion today is called oh, out the hash in the internet because that's the difference you have the wild wild web we have the intranet and we have the demilitarized let's put it in the dmz which is the buffer in between i'm talking about an application in here i mean like the risk of the application being hacked i don't need to to, I mean, like to bang my head much about that. If the application is ever exposed on the internet, then do not keep that application in here. No, 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 no. Push it there. That's the point. That's the point of the demilitarized zone to, to make like this first buffer that even if it falls, the internet is still safe. It's like the first trench, right? So the game that you are describing over here, I don't want to play today because this is the intranet we are talking about. And the internet, we have faith that the applications are not mis. Chief, that's not evil, right? So is there a security risk if refresh token is stored for years? Haha. <laughs> uh, yes, there can be, especially on mobiles. But if you are implementing with the, following the latest, the, 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 the state of the art standards in, 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 in writing Android or iOS applications, that is not a drama. Because mobile apps are really the game there. If you are talking about a backend being being hijacked, that's not so easy to happen, is it? But a mobile app keeps the refresh token in not in your servers, but somewhere on some mobiles. And um, if you did not took care, if you did not take care to to I don't know store the refresh token in a proper vault, I don't know all the terminology, but the, there is a risk. If you store the refresh token in an unencrypted file on the disk in the in, the, in an Android device, then <clears throat> you're stupid. <clears throat> You're gonna get hacked. Okay. So yes, that re that refresh token you don't don't sh should never lose that refresh token. Keep it very very keep, very hidden away, because the access token contains the rights of to all realms to all the realms. Not entirely sure. All the applications, you mean? If one microservice gets compromised, yes, I just explained. Yes, it could call any other APIs with the same access token, even if only for five minutes, because the access token has access to all the other user realms applications. You mean? That. Yes, it would be more secure if there would be separate access tokens for each realm. Folks, you are, you're messing things, you're confounding the two terms. Now, an app, a client, basically, now, inside the realm, 8180, let me log in as, as God just to show you something. Right. I could have multiple realms. Realms are like ecosystems. Now, inside an ecosystem, and the size of your realm, you can choose, of course. You can put 20 microservices, you can put a whole department, you can put a whole company inside. But if you have uh, your company in a realm, you better not allow other companies to join the same realm. So um, if one client in a realm is compromised, it can use the access token issued for that realm to target any APIs for which the access token is, is valid inside the same realm. But you cannot call other realms. 
I saw an, integra an integration between a large telco and another client. They were basically allowing a third party, uh, a third employees of a third party company to log in in their systems. But that was the integration between the realms. And in that case, the, again, this is more, more wild that we are talking about here. Right? But yeah, and, but you are right with the, with the exception that you should not be talking about realms, but applications. Okay. And Magomed, again, so you are saying that if there is no lot of no lot of identity related data, for instance, just the name and last name, we can just add this. This is the default. Yes, we add those to the access token. If you are afraid of not of exposing first name, last name, maybe the username works and the email. Uh, and yes, there is a GDPR problem. I know I, that token can contain personal identification information. So if you if you squeeze it a bit, it gets it gets weird. It gets up 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 up. That's why it's, I'm talking here today only about about hash inside the single let's say control environment or a single company, single department, if you want. And then think I'm kind of out of time, which is good. I just want to throw one more slide at you uh, with the sample GVT token, just to walk through all of this once more. If you want to, if you have other, any other leftover questions, now it's the time to ask them. So. A the token might, might include the exp will include the expiration date, usually five minutes after it was, it was issued. The login timestamp when the user actually logged in, right? Because it might, the user might have might log in two weeks ago, but because of the refresh token, I kept getting access token that expire after five minutes. Then a UUID, then a UUID of the user identity inside the realm. Not really useful. This is this is useful. The username, the human readable username, the name and the email, the personal information, as you pointed out, the real access, which is actually global data, global roles or permissions across the entire, across all applications, and the application specific ones, plus the necessary information for to do object level authorization to restrict what data can be seen or changed by the or by the holder of this token. Okay. If you have a couple of companies, then you would have different inter intranets. Yes, 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 yes. We the okay. This is called federated OAuth hash. Keyclock itself can delegate user federation. It can delegate to another provider, right? It can delegate to I don't know Active Directory, and you can log in by with your user with your Windows credential. And if you put sufficient jars in here, you can integrate with whatever you want. Right? And you can, you, you can enable more, like you can enable uh, social login with Google and stuff like that. Right? But that's like federated. You trust another third party to tell you who the guy is. And then you play from there on. Okay. Well, that was fun. Um, what else? What else? I was told to put a QR code at the end. So here it is. Uh, there will be another episode of this. Uh, all the hash in the wild in which I will explore all the uh, the exact interactions back channel and front channel with all the URLs sketch some some attacks and talk about also social logins like brainstorm a bit what material is moved with all these requests and what is it protecting us against and so on right but I will be talking about indeed about the hash across the boundaries of your company like, uh, log in with Google. Everyone wants that, right? Okay. <laughs>